simple Simon simply think a simple thing is just to act Once the fire gets ignited, does it all become ash? If the tires keep burning on the abs And the banks keep holding all the cash Does it mean we gotta take from the halves? I think I won't have I'm sick of this class, sick of this mass I just did the math, the numbers don't add I got support from dad, who taught me as a lad The chemicals can mix and explode in your hand So I'm in the lab, G1's gone mad My mic is a gun and the trigger pulled back I'm wearing all black, about to go bang Escucha mi pistola all over the land As I leave the launch pad, no money in my hands No padding in my pockets, but the whole world is watching Cause it's people over profit And that's my only promise I'm rich in experiencia My conciencia has driven me To the promised land Where Palestinians hold my hand While the B-girls dance And the MC spit And the DJ plays hits And the smile you can't miss And the grandma gives a kiss How you doing? Hi, Keith. Hi, Keith. Okay, Hi, Keith. okay. How you doing? Who am I speaking to? My name's Andy And uh, you're on speaker With some folks here in Rochester, New York Okay, good, good. How you doing, Andy? I'm good. Uh, we just okay. finished. You guys, um, you guys watched the film yet? Yeah, the we, documentary yet? Just watched the film, yep. Yeah. Okay, so you're done watching the film then. Can um, you hear me pretty good? Yeah, that yep. sounds great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you can hear me great. Okay, good, good. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming out, you know, to uh, watch the documentary and to learn more about this, uh, about our situation. Uh, and I'm calling just more or less to introduce myself and give you guys a general overview of, uh, you know, who I am and where I'm located in this whole thing. But just to also give you a impression where things, you know, stand presently with respect to the rest of the guys' cases. You know, uh, as you guys learned from watching the documentary, five of us were ultimately sentenced to death. And out of the five, um, I'm close. I'm the closest or the furthest along in the process in terms of, you know, finding out whether or not I would be executed now. You know, uh, I just recently filed my last appeal it was about 18 months ago and um, just received a date for oral arguments, which is basically the last opportunity I have at relief. You know, um, from my understanding, Andy uh, has a few copies of my book there, and um, hopefully I know you guys haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, at least not tonight. And, uh, but, you know, in the story, I tell, in the book, I tell the story about you know, the evolution of this whole thing, you know, why I was singled out and, you know, how I came to be placed on, on death row, you know, um, and, um, you know, the evidence, you know, that was withheld in my trial and really how they deprived me of a fair trial and, you know, how, you know, it's more just about myself, but how the legal system works as a whole when you're poor in this country, you know, we hear about it all the time, you know, it's the richest country in the world, which is true. You know, as a, you know, because of that, you know, you're entitled to an attorney. You know, if you can't afford one, if you're indigent. <clears throat> you know, I mean, you know, all those things sound good on paper, as if the, as the, the Declaration of Independence, you know, human rights, and all those things. But you find that in practice, you know, those things don't really translate if you're poor. You know, you know, justice and all these other things under capitalistic society, all those things become commodities as well, and they bought and sold to the highest bidder. And you find that out. You know, when you, uh, you know, enter to the justice system, you know, when you're poor, I think the percentage is, the statistics is 98% of these cases, you, are, the people plead guilty, you know, to 98% of the cases. So if you're poor, you never even go through a trial, you know, and, um, you know, I was in prison for murder. I got caught up in the drug trade in the late mid to late eighties. And, um, you know, one day I was, and in my drug house while I was selling drugs and a group of guys came to rob me and I was involved in a shootout, you know, with a guy. I talk about this briefly in the book, you know, and because of that, you know, um, I was sent to prison to serve a 15 year to life sentence for that, for murder. But, you know, with the possibility of parole. So I wasn't doing, you know, forever and a day in this place. I still had the opportunity at freedom when the riot, you know, erupted in 1990, 1993. I was, 23 years old at the time, the youngest out of all the guys. And, you know, um, as you learn from the documentary, you know, it's, you know, a spark, you know, um, as a result of uh, Muslims refusing to take a tuberculosis test. They objected to the way in which the uh, administration was, you know, chose to administer it. And um, 
you know, I wasn't involved in that part of it. In fact, I came out on the first day. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. You know, I came out on the first day and, um, were, you know, rounded up with a group of, in, you know, about 400 or so inmates who refused to participate in the riot. And it was only after that, you know, they put us in cells with, you know, nine other individuals, 10 people all together, you know, start naked and we in this, in this real pressurized situation. And it was in that situation that, you know, one inmate named Dennis Weaver lost his life. And, um, you know, after, you know, uh, the, his, this was discovered that this man was killed, you know, they wanted us to turn, you know, to become informants. And, you know, uh, you know, informants, you know, you know, I don't know how much you guys know about prison, but, you know, snitches, you know, are, you know, more or less, um, reviled in prison, you know. In fact, you know, most of the guys who were killed during the disturbance were suspected of being snitches. And, um, and so I refused to, you know, participate and also actually encourage other guys not to, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, help the uh, administration with their case and investigation and whatnot. And the reason why I came out, you know, voicefully, you know, on, in that sense is because, you know, we had been put in this real terrible situation, you know, prior to the ride. You know, we talk about the ride being about a TB test, but that's really what's the start of both the cameras back. We was talking about the prison conditions that preceded the riot were horrific, you know, you know, and, um, you know, then we was placed in it. When the riot happened, we was left on the yard. The Ohio Highway State Patrol showed up. The National Guard showed up, and they took a position around the perimeter fence. And while dead bodies were being brought out of the building and dumped on the yard, they just stood back and watched. And so, you know, basically we had to take our, take our lives into our own hands, which I did. You know, and, um, you know, fortunately, I made it out of that situation, you know, without being raped, without being brutalized. And, you know, after it was all over said and done, I felt that, you know, no one should help the administration. You know, they left us with dead for now. They want us to become informants, you know, to help them clear up the mess that they themselves, you know, allowed to happen. You know, I said, fuck that. Mm -hmm. You know, why yeah. become informants, yeah. put risk our life when they don't give a damn about us? You know, it's clear that they don't give a damn about us. And so... You know, when I came out forcefully like that, when I came out, you know, in demonstrations against administration after the uprising, you know, I made myself a target. You know, as I said, I came out on the first day. I wasn't involved in, you know, the tuberculosis uh, discrepancy. I wasn't in the Aaron Brotherhood, one of the other gangs who was said to have, you know, administered override and another gang, Black Angel Disciples. I wasn't part of any gang, but I was a part of a contention of inmates, of prisoners, who, you know, was opposed to the policies and practices of administration. And, you know, I participated in several demonstrations, you know, after the riot, you know, uh, when they, you know, this investigation went on and, you know, encouraged guys not to, you know, participate in the investigation. And, you know, and that was how I, you know, became a target, you know, and, uh, they, they charged me with five, the deaths of five suspected snitches. You know, sooner had they charged me, they offered me a deal and said, just cop out. You know, to murder, and we run these time concurrent with the time you're already doing. So for killing, allegedly killing five people, you know, I would essentially get, get no, you know, additional time added on to my sentence. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I refuse, you know. You know, um, you know, probably in hindsight, or, you know, as I think about it, you know, and I'm sure as they calculated it, I should probably what should have taken the deal. You know, because, you know, when you're poor, you really don't have a, you know, a win, you know, dealing with this, going up against this system and it's, you know, the, the, the resources and all those things are in balance, you know, the state have all unlimited resources and you just have a shoestring budget with attorneys who are overtaxed trying to make ends meet and whatnot. And so, but I refuse to take the deal, you know, and so, you know, I, I write in, in depth about all this stuff in the book and I'm glad you guys, I have the opportunity to read the book and my hope is that um, after reading the book, I know you guys are you know, Rochester, New York, and that you might not be able to make it to my oral arguments in Cincinnati, Ohio, this, this December the 2nd, but maybe you can find other, some other kind of way to support this effort that we're just trying to publicize our plight, trying to get as many people as possible to learn about the situation and, and join it with the larger movement about, you know, the injustices that, you know, going on not only with the, you know, prison industrial complex, but just in society in general. You know, poor people being singled out and, you know, this call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. You know, young black men being killed by police officers on the street. You have, you know, uh, you know, this so-called 
war on drugs and, you know, all these things taken individually seem like, you know, they don't have any connection with each other. But, you know, through my reading, I, I discovered that all these things are connected. Deindustrialization, you know, mass incarceration, you know, the war on drugs and, you know, all these various things that we're looking at, at in an isolated view are really all connected. And until we understand these connections and come together, and that, you know, in other words, we become connected, you know, across racial lines, across economic lines, and whatnot. And so that's really the purpose of, you know, um, you know, you know, showing the documentary, not just about our situation, just to bring people uh, get around the notion that this whole thing is just bigger than us. And so, you know, if you guys got any questions, we tend to the documentary about my, you know, specific case. And, you know, uh, or just, you know, the system in general, anything that I can add to the conversation that you guys are already having, you know, I'd like to be the voice for those who are, you know, behind bars and hopefully, you know, let you guys know that, you know, we too are engaged in this struggle as well, you know. Thank you. Keith, um, hi, my name is Dawn. Thanks for, um, you know, calling us tonight. And uh, this is a very powerful documentary. I saw it for the first time in Ottawa this summer at the... Um, uh, the ICOPA conference, and I got to meet Ben Turk and some of your support team, so it's an honor that you could come to... Um... I could barely hear you, Don. Can you uh, move closer to the phone? Yeah, is, the, is this better? Can you hear me? A little bit, yeah. Is it a little bit better? Is this where I should be speaking? Yeah, this is, you can just speak right Okay, yeah, we have a, a mobile phone connected to the computer, and I know I talk fast. Okay. I talk fast, so I'll I'm... try to uh, slow down a little. I can hear you good now. Okay, yeah. good. Um... But just to contextualize where we are, we have a community space here in Rochester, New York. It's a yeah. um, kind of a radical progressive community space called the Flying Squirrel Community Center. So that's where we showed the documentary mm -hmm. and we're doing a whole month of programming around stop mass incarceration. And you're our first uh, yeah. a, event for the month. So uh, thank you so much for you know, calling um, in, calling in tonight. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I'm happy to join y'all, you know, that's what I mean, you know. And, and uh, we are know, connected. Then, what you're saying about all these connected things, you know, we have a group in this other room having a meeting right now. Sadly, they're missing you because they're heading out to Ferguson, Missouri. They've already been to, you know, be on the ground to give support for all the, you know, protests and things that are happening there. And we do a lot here with yeah. police brutality in Rochester yeah. and housing foreclosure. And I work in Attica Prison doing... Um, a volunteer program, so um, right. this is just really powerful to like have this all connected. But I guess uh, one of my questions that I have is um, how, with you like showing this documentary and calling in all these places, like how often are you doing that, and how is this like visibility bringing support to the upcoming, you know, appeal, and what's happening in that regard? Thank you. Well, you know, I finished my book came out in January. And uh, when it came out, we went on the tour, showing uh, the documentary uh, as well as launching the book. And so we were doing these type of speaking engagements a little bit more frequently then at the beginning of the year. Then recently, uh, a documentary has been you know made about my own individual case because unlike the other four guys, you know my case, you know I didn't stay inside, and um, you know over these past two decades. You know, I've discovered a lot of evidence that was withheld during my trial. I mean, I have the actual statements of the actual perpetrators who, who admitted in some instances of killing the very people for whom I'm on, I'm on death row for. And so I discovered these things. I had a big falling out with my attorneys. And I explain all this stuff in the book, Don. But, um, you know, but as I, you know, said earlier and as I continue to say when I'm talking, this, you know, it, you know, I, I came to the realization that it's really bigger about me. I'm not under the impression that this book or the documentary, you know, um, by themselves where I'm going to somehow save my life. And it's not really just about saving my life, you know, and specifically, but about addressing this whole thing that we're caught up in, you know, poor people, you know, being pitted against other poor people, being, you know, you know, divided, you know, so these people could, you know, could the rule. You know, and so I'm just, you, you know, have 60 seconds left on this call. It's been real productive, you know, being now talking to people like yourself. You know, I, I called in Ottawa, Canada earlier this year. I spoke there, you know, I uh, spoke in New York earlier this year, too. Uh, you know, I've been speaking to college campuses all over the country, you know, and people have, you know, responded favorably, surprisingly to me anyway, you know, because, you know, we made the belief in here that people out of society don't give a damn about us. You know, that's what we are told. 
you know, that's what you hear from the mainstream media, and, you know, you come to believe those things, that that's where you get your news from. You know what I mean? But, you know, you you know know as well as I do that it's, it's another stream that's from me, you know, with the mainstream is, you know, the mainstream narratives. You know, you have poor people who are working across, reaching across racial line, economics, you know, uh, boundaries on this call. And trying to endeavor to work together. And so, you know, we know, you know, that that's a lie, you know, and yeah. that, you know, I think we just got to continue doing what an inmate at Ohio State's Penitentiary to accept dial zero. Your call is being connected. Thank you for using Global Telling. Okay. Hello. Hi. Uh, hey. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Good. So, um, I hope I answered Don's question. Thanks, Don. Yes. Dan. Thank you, Keith. So, my name is Susan. And hi, Susan. Hi. How you doing? Thank you so much. Um. It was, uh, you know, it, it's a issue that is is very frustrating and one that I, I'm always, I always wonder what can we do to help not only change the system but also to help you personally. Well, you know. Um the more general thing, you know, is, you know, doing exactly what you guys are doing now. Information is really the key. You know, knowledge is power, as they say, and I think that's true with respect to this thing that we're talking about. You know, the more pe the more you know, the further you can push this thing, the further you can get, you know, the more people you can get involved in, you know, opening up people's eyes. Because, you know, you know, these people who run society, who own society, you know, they invest billions and billions of dollars to maintaining this machine and keeping people, you know, indoctrinated and whatnot. And, but, you know, um, you've seen these pockets of resistance all over the country. People come together like you guys are today, you know, congregating, you know, sharing information, telling, you know, sharing stories. Because that's basically what it's about. You know what I mean? You know, um, yes, I'm in prison. Yes, I'm on death row. But, you know, it's people that's free, quote unquote, are in worse situations than I am in. We know that. You know, here in America, right now we're talking, you have somebody right now, unfortunately, that's tied up in somebody's basement, you know what I mean, and with no due process, no rights, you know. And, and so we live in a fish world, we live in a world that's, you know, that's steeped in violence, a fallen world, I like to say, like to, like to say you know what I mean. But, you know, even in the midst of all this stuff, you know, you have people like yourself that come together and want to, you know, for no other reason, just to do something righteous with your life. And so, you know, just being the inspiration for people to, you know, take on that thing, just, to, you know, to try to do something purposeful with their existence, because we only here on this planet for a short period of time. Even we live for a hundred years, you know, it's just a short period of time. And so you want to, you know, do something righteous with your life that you guys are doing, you know. But, you know, my own individual case, uh, you know, get the, I'm trying to get this book out to as many people as I possibly can. You know, as I, I mentioned earlier, a documentary will be coming out about my own specific case that should be out in the next couple of weeks. So maybe, hopefully, I'll be able to revisit, you know, come back, you know, where you guys are at the community center and, you know, show that so you can get a more in-depth, you know. Um, you know, the thing that's so unique about my case is that, you know, they didn't think I would go to trial. You know, I'm poor. You know, they took me to all white county and they tried my case and they and they didn't really try to cover their tracks because, you know, who's gonna give it who's gonna give a damn about a, you know, this 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 criminal? And they thought that, you know, you know, I'm you know, high school dropout, um, you know, they didn't think I would be able to write a book. I didn't know I could write a book. But, you know, instead of, you know, crawling under the bed when I came to death row, you know, I, I started I studied, you know, I, I read as much as I possibly can because you know, on the personal level I just wanna know what what how did this become of my life? How did this happen to my life? You know, you know, I always look back on my life. I remember when I was eight, nine years old or whatnot, and I remember, you know, you know, you know, having um a hold of a totally different um, you know, view of myself. And so, you know, somehow I lost that and you know, so my 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 objective over these past twenty years of being on death row is to try somehow try to find my way back to myself. And, you know, so it's not just really about you know, people always talk about, well, how, what can we do to help save your life? And that's not really, you know, my, my main drive, you know, is to save my life. I'm trying to live my life. And I think that's what the message that I'm trying to get across to people with, no matter where you are, you know, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, economically, you know, you're here to live. You know what I mean? So, you know, whether, you know, you're in prison or out of prison, freedom is relative. You know, it's based on 
you, how much awareness that you have and how, how, you know, empowered you are to utilize your freedom, your rights. And, you know, people are free, they have rights, but they don't use, so it's, it's the same as not having them. And so, you know, you know, that's one of the things I like to speak to when I make these calls is just try to get people engaged, you know, you know, right there where you are. You know what I mean? Try to do what you can right there where you are. Try to encourage the mother young person to join the movement. You know, a correctional institution and maybe recorded or monitored. Which is the exact thing, you know, the exact thing that I'm doing here. I'm trying to spread the word. I'm trying to tell people about George Jackson, about the Shah of Shakur. I'm trying to, you know, you know, trying to tell people about this movement, you know, that, you know, um, that we don't learn about in school, about the real Christopher Columbus and what he did and, you know, this, you know, all this stuff, you know, about, you know, uh, free market capitalism, about Karl Marx and this ideology, you know, and, you know, you know, you know, so, so that's what it's about, sharing knowledge, you know, that's what I, you know, yeah. Hey, did, did, okay, I, hey, this is Andy again, hi Keith, um, just want to say I'm halfway through your book and it, it's really, really great to read, it's a page turner, and I really appreciate, um, your thoughts and all your sharing that you're doing. And I, I had a specific question just about what you said that your next um, legal date is December 2nd? And, and December what? December 2nd, yes, in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, Ohio. I think you can go to my website and get the exact date and time and address and whatnot, uh, keepslamar.org. But uh, yeah, that's, this would be my last shot at relief here. And so it's a very important, pivotal uh, uh, point in this process that I've been on for the past two decades. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been without, you know, you know, tremendous struggle, man. Even with my own attorneys, I've been, you know, going, you know, I write about that in depth in the book. And so it's been an uphill battle, man, all the way through, you know. It's just a real um, experience and what it means to be poor in this country, man. And, um, you know, because, you know, if you're poor, you never actually go to trial you cop out just like 98 percent of the other people do and i did that in my original case even though the guys came to rob me yes i was selling drugs but you know um you know i was also you know uh, uh protecting my life and so yes i i took someone's life but it wasn't like a cold-blooded murder you know i didn't go looking for these guys they came to where i was at trying to rob me and then uh, you know i i just stood my ground that's ridiculous as that may sound and um you know, but I wasn't a, like a cold-blooded murderer. I wasn't, you know, you know, no serial killer going around plotting and how to kill people would not. And, you know, but, you know, I came to prison. And, and here in prison, you know, ironically, I found myself, you know, accidentally, you know, as the case may be, you know. And, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, uh, you know, you know, writing that book is, you know, uh, something of a miracle for me because, as I mentioned, you know, I dropped out of high school in 11th, 11th grade, man. I came to uh, prison in didn't really know the difference between, you know, um, there and there, T-H-E-I-R, T-H-E-R-E, you know, and, you know, I think that speaks volumes about the education system in this country when you can make it through all those, um, you know, years of school and don't know the difference between those two words. But, you know, I, you know, met some good people here in prison. They, you know, you know, taught me school, you know, through me and, you know, I, you know, it's been a blessing in disguise, man. But really. I hate to say that because, you know, people assume that I'm trying to say that I'm glad I'm in prison. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm glad to be alive and I'm glad to be living my life. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. 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 Hi, Keith. This is uh, Ted. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really, I don't have a question. I just bought your book. Um, but, uh, you and your co-defendants are on my mind, and I want to thank you for your courage. And Can you move a little closer to the phone, Clint? Yeah, I want to thank you for your Breaking courage and your um, ability for you know living your life and, and getting your message out. You said some really powerful things tonight, and uh, we're going to be publishing this interview. And you know, just uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Um... You know, it's an honor, man, that, you know, to join, you know, join you guys, to be able to, you know, even, you know, not not even two years ago, I wasn't even allowed to use the phone. You know, uh, we went on a hunger strike back in 2011. I, I write about that in depth in the book. And, uh, you know, yeah, you know, um, us five guys, the Lucasville Five, you know, they isolated us, put us in solitary confinement. Well, I've been in solitary confinement for 21 years now. 
you know, for those of you, you know, don't know what that means in terms of days and hours, you know, that's 7,660 some days I've been in this cell that I'm talking to you guys from. And that's not even mentioning that hundreds and hundreds of that's thousands of hours, you know. From an Ohio correctional institution and maybe recorded or monitored. But you know, all of us, we have this 24 hours in the day. And whether you're in solitary confinement, it's really how you utilize those 24 hours. You know, some of that time, obviously, you know, had to be used for sleep, but other than that, you should have to try to do something, you know, uh, righteous with your life. And that's what I've been trying to do over these past 21 years, you know, have a, you know, a vast library here. Um, you know, everything from Karl Marx, like I mentioned, and, you know, the see white meals, sociological imagination. You know, I poured over these books over these past years. You just to more or less understand, because it's not just about my own individual biography. It's about this, this larger thing, you know, these big ups and downs in society, you know, uh, that we don't really seem uh, connected to, but have a, you know, a great impact on our lives. And, you know, we feel powerless to affect, you know, uh, these big changes, but we can, each of us, you know, individually and collectively, and I guess, you know, it's an honor, man, like I mentioned, like I said, you know, to be able to join you guys in what you're doing tonight, and hopefully, you know, from this, we can just stay connected, and that's the main thing, you know, not just to, you know, pass each other in the night, but to make these connections and keep these connections, you know, across these lines that, you know, separate us, you know. Yes, and So that's my hope, you know. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for this is Dawn again. Just, um, you know, thank you for this keeping this, um, you know, and sharing this inspiration and integrity that you have, because, um, you know, you took such a strong conviction to not um, snitch and to testify the way you could have. And when you have doubts about how differently your life could have been, had you have done so, I still hope um yeah. Within that, there's still a lot of, um, you know, just gratitude for the choice that you made because as much as you're suffering for yeah. it right now, I think it's so um, strong and I, I just believe and have so much hope that that something, some justice will be served, you know, one way or another and that choice that you made um, will fulfill you and nourish yeah. you somehow. I, I really hope that for you and thank you so much for inspiring that. Well, yeah, I appreciate that, Don. Yeah, um, you know, I I made that choice when I was 23, and not really understanding what, you know, I you know I write about this stuff in a book. I slept in mattresses. I've been beaten. I've been on, you know, various hunger strikes, starved myself, and all these things. So I didn't know that that that's what my choice would entail. You know, we don't know that. You know, but um, I'm glad I made that choice. You know, um, it's been a hell of a journey. I've met some incredible people along the way. Uh, both dead and alive, you know, you know, some of these authors, some of my best friends are, you know, these various authors who, you know, you know, for long periods of time, they were the only people who I um, could communicate with, you know, solitary confinement, as, it, as the name implies, is a very, you know, barren type existence. And, uh, you know, yeah, um, you know, it's been a hell of a journey. How often can you get visitors? Well, I get visitors. You know, quite frequently, you know, uh, that's in that sense, uh, you know, um, I get visits, I was just on a visit today, I get about, you know, I average about eight to ten visits a month, you know, um, we just want to write the full contact visits, I went 20 years without being able to hug my family and whatnot, and like I mentioned earlier, we went on a hunger strike in 2011 and won the privilege to uh, have full contact visits, so, you know, my nieces and nephews who I've watched grow up, you know, I've been, you know, been blessed with the opportunity to be able to hug and kiss them, you know, you know, recently. And so, you know, um, it's all been worth it, you know, it really, is, it really has, you know, uh, so I'm not here complaining. I'm just explaining that, you know, the journey, you know, that I've been on and, you know, hopefully, you know, my, something in my story resonates, and, you know, we find that we have more in common than not, you know? For sure. For sure. Any other questions? Anyone have questions? You gave us a lot to think about. Susan? Yeah, I just, uh, this is Susan again. I just wanted to ask you, you said you have another film coming out in a couple weeks. Yeah, um, well, that's projected. It's about mid-October. We're we, we doing the finish. they doing the finish, um, the final edits on it now. 60. And um, left on this call. I think it, 
I think it is be called condemned, and uh, it's just a really compilation or a crystallization of the whole situation where you guys in 30, 40 minutes can get a, you know, the uh, general grasp of my situation as it presently stands, and you know, you know, hopefully, you know, from that we can get more people involved. You know, yeah, that's the hope anyway. Yeah. Well, we're thinking. We're thinking about coming out in December and maybe getting a group here, so we'll, we'll work on it and, um, you know, see if we yeah, can Yeah, yeah, that'll be great. that would be great. So, I, you know, yeah, that's the, uh, you know, let's come together. You know, ironically, I won't be able to attend the meeting. Oh, really? I'm the only one who won't be able to attend, so I'm asking people to be my eyes and my ears. Why you can't know, you Show attend? up in my place. You have 10 seconds left on this call. Yeah. Did you... Don't ask why you can't attend. Isn't that illegal? Okay, just hold the line again, and then he'll be right back. I owe correctional institution, and may be recorded or monitored. I have a prepaid call from your Keith, an inmate at Ohio State Penitentiary, to accept. Your call is being connected. Thank you for using Global Telling. Okay, hello. Hi, Keith. Hey. Hey. Hi, we are Okay, yeah. Hey, hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah, so we had two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, uh, how can they deny you the right to be at your own hearing? I mean, you know, your guess is as good as mine, but the system, man, um, it's, it's, um, it's bizarre. You know, uh, I'm not allowed to attend. Um, you know, uh, the attorneys, as you guys will find out in the book, I, and, you know, until recently I hadn't spoken to, no, to them in over close to two years. We had this big falling out and, you know, they filed motions to withdraw from my case and I, you know, asked them, you know, the courts to grant that motion, but that was denied. And so I'm stuck with these attorneys who until recently, I, you know, was on bad terms with. I'm trying to, you know, do what I can to repair the relationship. But this whole thing is strange, man. It, it really is. It's, um... You know, I can't explain it. I, I really can't, you know, other than to say that, you know, the whole process has been bizarre. That's the only thing that has been consistent in the terms of this overall 20 past 20 years. It's just a strange process, man. Everything that you, you hear about, we read about, we, you know, uh, you know, talk to believers, we understand that it's the reality, you know, the difference, you know, uh, Hey Keith, Keith, your phone's breaking up. Keith, your phone's breaking up. Okay, yeah, it might be coming through. That's better. Yeah. Can you guys hear me pretty good? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but you know, uh, I don't know why I'm. I won't be allowed to. That's just the rule. I, I won't be allowed to be there. You know, so I'm asking as many people as possible to just show up in my place. And, um, you know, make sure, I talk about it in my book, and make sure that my attorneys do their job. You know what I mean? Because I, I think they believe, you know, probably rightfully so, that I wouldn't have a lot of supporters and whatnot. And, and you know, even my, I've been shocked by how much support I've been able to garner over these past, you know, 10, 15, 20 years or so. And so, you know, I think they underestimated, you know, uh, my resolve, our resolve, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, yeah, so I'm just like, you know, my attitude is like, you know, let's show them, you know, let's show them what, you know, we, you know, poor people can do, you know, and so, yeah, so that's been my attitude, you know, my whole thing was driving me to be honest with you guys, it's just pure anger, you know, I'm just so upset about how these people, you know, did me in my trial, how they, that was the whole mockery, how they, you know, the smug expressions on their faces and being able to railroad me and whatnot and, you know, and then to have this shit, you know, stand up as justice, it's, I'm pissed off about it, you yeah. know, to be frank, you know, and right, so, right. you know, um, that's the thing that's driving me, and maybe you have other, you know, energy, sources of energy, use it, you know, that's what I'm using, you know, and, um, yeah, I tend to keep using it. <clears throat> yeah, my, my other question, this is Ted again, my other question um, was, can you just describe what a shoe is, solitary confinement, what is that? Oh man, it's a uh, unit cell. It's exactly as the name implies. You in a cell, twenty three hours a day. Um, you know, and um, depending on the kind of guys you're around, you know, which is, you know, nowadays mostly young guys. Uh, you guys are in various stages of unraveling. You have guys, you know, this situation is it's horrifying, man. You know, guys 
who, you know, sit right next to you, you know, snap and lose their mind and end up smearing their own feces all over their body, you know, guys who, you know, forget their name, you know, guys who, you know, become so disembobulated that, you know, they don't even know how to, you know, uh, um, take care of themselves anymore. So it's horrifying because as a human being, you understand that you're no different than these other human beings, that you are just as vulnerable and just as fragile as these other human beings. And so it's scary, man. And, you know, I've been in solitary confinement for 21 years and without any major conduct reports, without any major rules and fractions. But because of my last involvement in the ride, I'm slated to stay here until I die. You know, this is what they tell us, you know. And so... You know, it's been a hard thing because you know I don't know what it is in the person's mind that snaps, that gives way to this invisible pressure, you know, and, you know, next thing you know, they're smearing feces all over themselves. But, you know, I'm just terrified that one day I might wake up. From an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. One day I might wake up with my hands, you know, uh, you know, swimming around in my own shit. And so I dread all that stuff, man. But, you know, I've been lucky and blessed. And, you know, my family's been stuck with me, my friends, great friends I have in my life. And so, you know, people with whom I can test my reality pretty much keep me moving and, you know, sound and sane, you know, uh, uh, path on sound and sane path. And so, but yeah, Terrence Solitaire confinement is hell, man. It really is. You know, that's the only thing I can really say about it. It's hell, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I got I got one more. Um, for a guy that didn't have any questions, I've got three now. Um, I was okay. I was wondering, um, do political prisoners exist in the United States, and are you one? Do you consider yourself a political prisoner? Well, you know, this is a debate going on. Who co constitutes political prisoners? You know the, uh, you know the, um, you know the, um, the people who you know you know you know kind of perpetuate these, you know, um, the economy, they say that, you know, you know, guys have to be politically conscious or whatnot, but, you know, let's face it, you know, most guys are in prison be not just because they're poor, because they're ignorant, you know, and, you know, and if you think about it, if you read about it, if you learn about it, you understand that prisons are not just full of criminals, people pay crimes, crimes is based on policy, mm -hmm. based on practice, so everybody, technically speaking, uh, uh, you know, our political prisoners, whether they realize it or not, that's my view. You know, whether you realize it or not, you know, capitalism, you know, as a system is, is bogus. You know, um, the wealth is 1% owned close to 50% of all the wealth and resources. So just based on that unequal distribution of wealth, it's politics. It's policies that allow this, you know, these, this, 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 this equal, um, you know, uh, thing of resources, you know, occur. You know, exists. And so, you know, from that sense, you know, I think, yeah, everybody who's in prison, over 2,000, 2.3 million people behind bars are political prisoners. Yeah, I, I wholly, I, I sincerely believe that, yeah. Right. You know, but I know, you know, for the, um, you know, for the, you know, anarchists or people who, you know, uh, you know, um, have a, you know, interest in, you know, creating these or perpetuating these dichotomies, man, I think they would say that. You know, you're on the political prisoners if you're politically aware, you know, and I think that, that has to change, you know, you know, that, you know, people who are aware need to, you know, reach out to people who are not aware, make them aware, you know, help them, you know, educate them, you know, to the reality of their situations. And if you're not doing that, I feel to see how you, a political prisoner or a political person in the first place, or call yourself a, you know, a righteous person if you're not trying to help somebody who don't know, you know, become, you know, aware of their own situation so they might be able to do better for themselves and for the community that they are uh, a part of, you know? Yeah. Hey, Keith, this is Andy again. Um, we okay. were just reading that the one of the prosecutors in, in your case, Mark Pipemeyer, was also the prosecutor yeah. that oversaw or encouraged the grand jury to return no indictments to the Beaverton, the Walmart shooting? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's, you know, apparently he's the go-to guy where, you know, uh, you know this is a guy um, named Derek you know, in this case as well, and just as in my case, he withheld exculpatory evidence that is evidence that was favorable to Derrick's defense. And it took 15 years for them to uncover this evidence, and, you know, Derrick was ultimately uh, released from death row. But this guy, Mark Pitman, you know, you know, these guys are not punished for doing this, for, you know, willfully having this evidence for, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, there's no accountability involved in it, even though it's been proven that they knew of this evidence and, and they knew that he you know, was 
done it, but this is how you get promoted, and this is how you know you uh, get people to get from. This is how you get people to get from. It's kind of breaking up. Uh, now we can, but we did, couldn't a minute ago. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. Yeah, they're coming through with the nurse. Oh, you know, you that go. happens in the walk of talking in the with the signal, but uh yeah, Mark Peepmeyer, um, this is his MO, you know, he, he withheld withholds the the evidence that a person needs to, you know, um, prove their innocence and, you know, uh, he went guilty versus this is how they do it. And it's been proven over and over again that this is how they operate. And, but until people come together and demand that justice be done, you know, uh, I don't see why he even feel the need to change. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's what we hoping to do. We're hoping to, you know, really, you know, you know, shed light on this thing that, you know, uh, that happened. And, and not saying they were to isolate the incidents, but demonstrate, you know, by, you know, Derek Jameson, this guy I mentioned earlier that was on death row. He had part of a documentary that'll be coming out soon. And, um, we talk about Mark P. Meyer involvement in this specific case. And, you know, we hoping that people could, you know, you know, you know, reach these conclusions on their own, you know, and, you know, say that something has to change, you know, you know, and, uh, um, hopefully we, we'd be able to do that, you know. Yeah, this guy's a straight maggot, man. Straight piece of shit, you know? Yeah. That's Woo! Right, right. Yeah. Poetically said, I like that. Um, I just uh, just want to say that despite all the bars and the walls and the barbed wire, um, you know, the, this feeling that I have of, like, my heart breaking and my mind breaking around your case and, and others and just this whole, you know, uh, mass incarceration crisis yeah. Um, there's there's so much love, and I think that and respect, you know, for you and all these other people that are enduring this type of oppression, and that permeates. Yeah. And I hope you feel that and you connect with that because there's just a lot sure. of like gratitude and respect, um, you know, coming your way from a lot of people. So again, just thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I feel it. I definitely feel it. And I think you know, uh, you know, some years from now we we'll look back on this era. And, you know, just as we look back on slavery, as yeah. it was just a, you know, a, a horrible thing as a society, you know, because, you know, 2.3 million people, you know, as not to mention uh, millions of people on probation and parole and whatnot. And so the problem that be, this is what they have come up with, you know, to deal with the, the unequal distribution of wealth. They haven't, they haven't considered coming up with a system that's more equitable towards, you know, everybody. You know, by them having this one, and their whole thing is, well, we don't have, you know, we don't have enough room for these people to function in our economy, to lock them up, put them in prison. You know what I mean? And, you know, and so, you know, in the richest countries in the world, I think that's a, a, a you know, sad commentary, you know, society, man. But, you know, even sadder is that people, you know, we go for this. You know, we, we, we allow them to separate us by a race, by economic, you know, uh, status and whatnot, and we, we go along for it. You know, and so you know, you know. Hopefully, people will wake up, and I think it's inevitable because you know the the the, the, the gap between the rich and the very poor is becoming broader and broader. And middle class is you know basically evaporating. And they need the middle class as a buffer to really keep people from meeting each other. You know, you and I, you know, Don or Susan, we we don't even supposed to be having this conversation. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But we are right. because you know they have went too far. And they agree they have taken too far in, you know, they, uh, you know, rapacious type, you know, buy for material, you know, for wealth, you know. And so now we are talking. And right. see, that's the thing. If you run a society, you don't want people to start talking. Right. They're you know, petrified. People, yeah. No, they're petrified. Yeah, and you know. I, I see that now. So that's what's yeah. so important about, you know, this what we're doing. You know, I'm sitting in the cell on the house, Superman, I'm a death row prison. No way we're supposed to be talking. Right. Well, you when I, I mean? when I go into no Attica... Way. When I, when I go into Attica yeah. to do the work there, we do a three-day program. We spend 10 hours yeah. with the prisoners inside doing a lot of uh, conflict resolution, um, yeah, you know, yeah. communication, so. game playing, these kind of things. And at the end of the, you know, three days, we've built such a strong community. And a lot of us, I mean, I've been working with some of these guys now for a few years, and there's just so much care and respect and appreciation. Yeah. It's this, like, beacon of yeah. light in such a dark place. And the... 
you know, the right. guards and the administration, the sergeants, I mean, they look at the volunteers that come in and they loathe us, you know, they, they yeah, look yeah, at yeah. us so, with like hatred and, you know, just so despise that. 60 seconds mm -hmm. left on this call. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I don't want to take the time, thing. but do you do letters? Like, do you write a lot? Are you writing too many people? Yeah, Are yeah. you looking I for write, more writing? My number and stuff is in the book. You guys, you know, feel free to write me. And yeah, let's stay connected. Let's, you know, uh, of course. You know, yeah, I'm not just talking. I'm really, you know, trying to dedicate my life to living, you know, what I've learned, living on, you know, knowledge of my experience. You know, this is no, uh, no game. This is real deal. You know. Well, thank you. You're a beautiful, beautiful man, and stay strong yeah. and beautiful. Okay. And thank Thanks you so much you. for this. Thanks, Keith. We'll be thank in touch. Okay. Right. Yeah. We love yeah, you. Yeah, so yeah. I appreciate yeah, it. Appreciate you know, you, and you know, uh, equal honor. You know, you guys. No, uh, let's stay connected. Let's stay together, okay? Yes, absolutely. All right. Have a nice night. Ten seconds. All right. Love you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. All right. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. 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 Tell you that you better get dope If you ain't know, if you ain't got it How you gon' grow, how you gon' thrive In the back of my mind, I'm ready to ride Rob that bank, done with the chase Run up on chase with a mask on my face Reaganomics fail, most of my people in jail Well, what you think is gon' happen? Unemployment is rampant War on drugs, war on the poor Prison revolving doors Mission accomplished, they make a profit We get processed A felony on your application You gon' have to check market Checkmate, no check to check If you can't get high, no pension plan If you can't retire, know what you gon' do If you can't rely, no no one in your kids rely on you I'ma do what I do The system will too Criminalize my every move Move, move, move